Hello. Hello, Professor Zaid. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? I can I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, it's wonderful. The technology allows us to have a conversation when you're thousands of miles away. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe there is a little problem with the with the with the uh, sound. I think it's blocking somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, now it's clear. It's clear now. It's oh, it's clear now. Yeah. It's clear now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So so it I'll be joined time. by my my friend and colleague Omrita Chakraborty, and I think Omrita can speak. Um. Yes. First of all, thank you for taking out the time to be with us here today, and. Um, I just submitted my thesis on the Bengali fairy tale tradition of the late 19th and the early 20th century, where I have read and exchanged with some of your ideas um, from grim legacies, from the uh, media hyping of fairy tales, the Cambridge Companion to fairy tales, uh, and obviously fairy tales and the art of subversion, as well as uh, some of those ideas, because we sort of had this parallel uh, thing going on in the late 19th and the early 20th century, when fairy tales derived from oral traditions were also used for a nationalist purpose uh, during the early Indian independence movement and a cultural revival that was sought. So there's a parallel with the Grimm's and a lot of Grimm's legacies in Bengal. Um, so that is something that I have read and then went on to read the rest of the uh, books certain ways. So this is kind of a fangirl moment for me. So thank you, Professor, for joining us. Uh, no problem. I, I am there to talk to people and help them and uh, develop their ideas. And I, I want to learn something also. Thank you. So Professor Zaid will be beginning in another seven minutes? Yes. OK, OK, right. Yes, and uh, I, I must say, uh, I only have an hour today because we're moving. Sure, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, and uh, we're, my, my wife thinks that I'm getting very old, which I am, and we have a big, big house. And so we're downsizing. Right, and, okay. Uh, so the house, the house is, a, is a big mess and we have people coming and going, but I have a good hour. Oh, definitely, definitely. We will wrap it up within one hour. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, are other people joining us? Yes. Uh, uh, quite a number of other people, actually. Some of our friends and colleagues, and as well as some of Oshijit's students, and also people I know. Um, I'm sort of associated with this uh, society. It's called the International Society for the Study of Love and Gender. So uh -huh. some of the people I know from there who are very interested to hear you talk. Uh -huh. So uh, some of them will be joining us as well. They should be here now. So how, how is the weather in India right now where you are? Um, it's the start of the terrible Indian summer, so oh. um, not. So it's going very hot. Uh, uh, not very pleasant, at, but still, it's still <laughs> early summer, so not that bad as well. It's going yes. to get worse in a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I live in Minnesota, and yeah. uh, Minnesota is right next to Canada, so it's a very cold climate. Cold. But I, I, I'm a New Yorker, and my wife dragged me here, and I call Minnesota Siberia <laughs> because it's so cold and, and uh, difficult. Uh, uh, but Minneapolis is, is a very cultural city. It's, it's one of the best cities. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a jewel in many ways. And people don't come here because they're afraid of the weather, which is good. Uh, because then, you know, we don't have the all the uh, difficulties that very large cities like Chicago or uh, L.A. and so on and so forth. It's it's a, a, a there are actually 
three to five lakes in the middle of the city. So it's, it's a very pretty city. We live in an overpopulated country as it is. And Oshijit yes. belongs to one of the oldest cities. Um, I live very close by, but I live in a smaller town. He lives directly mm -hmm. in the city. So he yes. lives in a much more crowded place, I suppose. Um, I have more trees around me than Good. he does. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, Professor Zipes, I think we should begin since you are really short and short of time. Okay, so let, let's, Amrita, we should begin, right? Uh, yeah. Those are five minutes left, I think, I think we should begin. Right, yeah. okay. Right, so our uh, special guest today is uh, Professor Jack Zipes, uh, who would deliberate on fairy tales, politics, sexuality, and cognition. Uh, good morning, Professor Zipes, and good morning and good evening to everyone attending this discussion from different parts of the world. Uh, now to um, let's have a, a small introduction uh, uh, on Professor Jack Zipes, uh, who is a professor uh, emeritus of German and Combative Literature at the University of Minnesota. In addition to his scholarly work, he is an active storyteller in public schools, founded Neighborhood Bridges at the Children's Theatre Company in Minneapolis, and has written fairy tales for children and adults. Some of his recent publications include The Irresistible Fairy Tale, The Cultural and Social History of a Genre, 2012, The Golden Age of Folk and Fairy Tales from the Brothers Grimm to Andrew Lang, 2013, and Grimm Legacies, The Magic Power of Fairy Tales, 2014. Most recently, he has published The Sorcerer's Apprentice, an anthology of magical tales, 2017, Tales of Wonder, retelling fairy tales through picture postcards, 2017 again, Phyllis Ivan and his faithful horse, Double Hump, 2018, The Hundred Riddles of the Fairy Bellaria, 2018, and Slap Bam, The Art of Governing Men, Edouard Lavoilaz, uh, political fairy tales 2018. In 2019, he founded his own press called Little Mole and Honey Bear and has published The Giant Owl and Tiny Tim 2019, uh, Johnny Beadless 2020, Use of the Ostrich 2020, and Kittle the Great and All You Want to Know About Fascism 2020. It's such a pleasure to finally have you here on the screen of Zayt and thank you. Thank you for, for agreeing to be uh, a part of this uh, interview immediately. Um, yeah, so if you have... Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you for your invitation. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for, for accepting. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, dear audience, uh, please write them down in the chat box. Uh, they'll be taken up towards the end of the session. Uh, so I'll re now request my friend and co-interviewer for the session, Omrita Chakraborty, uh, who has devoted 10 years of her life uh, to fairy tales, to understanding folk tales, uh, to begin with our questions. Over to you, Omrita. Thank you, Ushji. So uh, the, I'll directly jump to the question. So the first question to Professor Zipes is, you've used Jameson's idea that the narrative is a socially symbolic act for the study of the literary fairy tale. Keeping that in mind, why would you say, or how would you define the fairy tale as a socially symbolic act? Uh, yes, um, I, I think the uh, fairy tale uh, uh, fairy tales are, are metaphors. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Fairy tales are metaphors and enable us to estrange ourselves from the real conditions under which we live. So, paradoxically, uh, what appears to be unreal in, in the tales allows us to say more about reality than uh, if we were to write realistic tales. So in, if we use symbols uh, and metaphors to tell a story, we can say more about social conditions. Uh, we can offer a critique of social conditions and a wish for different social conditions. So in other words, these the social aspect of telling tales, whether they're fairy tales, oral tales, literary tales, and so on, legends, the short, the, what, um, what we call the sort of short uh, genres, like the legend, and, uh, and uh, also you can say the fables as well. These are generally tales 
that are extremely important because um, the originators of these tales, whoever tells these tales, are trying to uh, either improve our awareness of what is happening in our society. So that's the social aspect. And uh, they are generally metaphorical, symbolical, because a lot of the things that are said in these tales are not necessarily approved by those people who have power. So uh, there's a, a um, Beto Brecht, the famous German uh, writer, uh, theater director, and so on, always talked about what he called Sklavenspache. Sklavenspache is the language or, of the slaves, in quotes, slaves. We are all, Brecht thought that we were all slaves of the capitalist system. And so the only way we can protest and talk to one another is through a language, symbolical language, that cannot be understood by most of the people in power. And so you can get away, you can sort of survive uh, uh, by using this language that uh, you can say um, things that really um, make the people who have power worried. And so that's why I think that use of the uh, fairy tale or referring to a fairy tale as a social, socially symbolical act. Okay, it's an act. Uh, a, uh, it's actually to a great extent, it enriches the culture and at the same time critiques what is uh, unfair in the culture. Um, so uh, again, coming uh, to the gray area, uh, I mean, what you said that it is something that critiques and at the same time contributes to culture. So yes. generally we have a lot of fairy tale traditions that come from oral traditions. Um, hence, yes. when we talk about the gray area and the fine line of difference between the folk tale and the fairy tale, how can we define the relationship between the fairy tale and the folk tale? Yes, uh, the, uh, we have to realize, you know, that uh, all human, the human species uh, is, uh, thousands of years old and uh, people uh, in, in the, <clears throat> as human beings or, or as the species developed, uh, they, they also developed language well, thousands of years ago. Uh, and they did not know, have alphabets, they did not have grammars, <laughs> they did not have a standard way that you must speak. Uh, they had their own dialects, uh, all sorts of thousands of languages. And we um, have to realize that they used, as, as, as human beings developed language, they used it to survive the conditions under which they were living. I'm talking about environmental conditions. Uh, they had to also um, take a place with animals, with all, toys, all types of other species. And so, at a certain point, uh, we must realize, and, and we have the evidence is actually in are in the oral tales that have been collected, uh, uh, that people began using the language uh, to survive in conditions that were some uh, quite often hostile, and so um, uh, one of the things we must think of, you know, in terms of. Let us take Little Red Riding Hood as an example. Uh, uh, at one point, uh, or, uh, people realized that for women uh, to go into the forest without any guards or by themselves, they might be violated, they might be raped, these things might happen to them. So women generally were not allowed to travel or go anywhere. And one of the tales probably that developed was uh, a man coming back from the woods, from the forest, and saying to people, there's a wolf out there, and he will eat you um, if you, uh, and attack you if you go out there. And that tale uh, then uh, 
became slowly, it wasn't called Little Red Riding Hood, it was just called a peasant girl was sent through the forest to see uh, <clears throat> help her grandmother or grandparents or friends or whatever. And, and so they warned the girl, be careful, don't talk to wolves or watch out for the wolves and so on. And uh, uh, we know today be, uh, that violation of women happens every four minutes. A woman is raped, a woman is violated. And so this, ta this particular tale, which was generally oral for thousands of years, uh, was picked up by uh, writers, okay, we're talking in the post uh, Christ, uh, the, the, let's say post uh, Roman, uh, Roman Greco, Greco Roman area. Uh, and the tale was picked up and, and it was vital for uh, women and vital for families um, who had to protect uh, the women. And even today, uh, this tale is still extremely important. So the oral tradition came first in almost everything we write. Uh, we talk to ourselves all the time. Uh, I don't know whether you know, but psychologists have detected that uh, as we walk along, we're talking to ourselves in our minds, and which is for me, part of the oral tradition, because I'm not writing it down, I'm not honing it, I'm not making it into a work of art. But that's what it, the oral tradition serves as the, I would call, feast. <laughs> the feast of great writers and artists uh, who want to change it or make it different or comment on it or something like that. So um, I think and there are many dialects also that are ex extremely significant and they and most people don't even understand those dialects they, they, they may be living in the same country and then travel up north for 100 miles and not be able to understand the people because they have another way of talking so all of these what i call adaptations or uh, not only adaptations but one could say uh, creations uh, in the sort of for the more literate people uh, are based or stem from some type of oral tradition. And it is up to researchers and translators to recognize that and to give credit to the common people uh, and to, to ourselves to a certain extent because we write what we think and speak in our heads. Thank you. Yeah, so um, moving away from the oral yeah. to the literary, um, you talk of paratexts um, in your writing in the context of media hyping of fairy tales and suggest that paratexts take away the integral meaning of text. Would it be possible to think of the introductions, prefaces, prose manifestos that, that accompany literary fairy tales as paratexts that add layers of meaning on the text instead of subtracting meaning from the stories. Um, for example, when fairy tales are used for the purposes of cultural nationalism, as the Grimm's had done um, and has, as has been used uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century Bengal, it were these texts that plugged the story text into the nation building discourses. Yeah, I, I think I'm a little was a little sort of unjust in my critique uh, of of uh, the uh, of the paratext uh, because uh, you know they can enrich the tales. For, let me give you one good example: E. T. A. Hoffmann, uh, uh, the great writer of fairy tales in Germany in the Romantic period, the late Romantic period, uh, in 18, um, about 1819, he published um, a book called The Serapian Brothers. And it's a story, wonderful frame story, in which uh, a bunch of, of uh, artists, writers, uh, cultivated people get together and form a club called The Serapian Brothers. And then Hoffman has them talking and drinking uh, and, and quite often 
Critics thought that Hoffman was an alcoholic, which he never was. But at, at any rate, they drink and they're having a great time and they tell tales to one another. And the frame of this tale is not unusual because if we go back to uh, Giambattista Basile, uh, uh, Italian tales, or even Straparola, uh, uh, Gianfranco Straparola in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, they use frames and uh, as a parate paratext. Uh, and we have to understand how they use that frame and what purposes and how that frame uh, enabled them uh, to create a different type of understanding of, of, their, of what the people who are telling these tales are talking about. And they convey then a different sense uh, to the readers of, of, of these uh, tales uh, because of the fact uh, they are packed together in a way that uh, uh, forms its own meaning and not just, uh, not just the tales themselves are significant, but the fact that they are being told in a community, what is this community? Why are they doing this? And uh, what do we learn other than what's actually being written in the tales? So I, I, I do think, par I think uh, you, it, it all depends on how uh, let us say artistic you are, if we jump to the sort of uh, 20th century to Angela Carter in uh, uh, Bloody Tales and, and uh, uh, the, her, she set a frame that was interesting because she, she actually gave more meaning to fairy tales than they've ever had before from a feminist point of view. So uh, I, I, my criticism or critique I take back I, I don't take it fully back, but I, I think that uh, we can uh, use uh, these types of characters in very interesting ways. Um, thank you. My supervisor will be very happy to know that. Um, so <laughs> my fourth question here, fairies, uh, when we talk of subversion, fairies were introduced in the 17th century as secular sources of female magic. Uh, hence, they were subversive figures because all legitimate source of magic was the Christian church. However, from being subversive figures added to fairy tales, they became integral to the genre. And the genre most popularly came to be named after fairies. There were large scale presence of fairies in Victorian texts and later. Uh, and these were very different fairies from the fairies of medieval and 16th century folklore. So what were the social and historical forces at work here that contributed to this shift? Yes, uh, the, I, I think that uh, this it was extremely significant period uh, because it, 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 and generally that the period was from 1690 uh, up through maybe even the middle up through maybe up to the French Revolution, but in the in the 17th century, France and the French were dominant in Europe, uh, and uh, they had they, it was the first country really that unified itself despite all the differences in different regions. But Louis the 14th had uh, also spent a great deal on wars. He was uh, a fairly vulgar <laughs> person. Uh, uh, and, but French was extremely powerful and uh, women uh, beginning in the early part of the 17th century because of the fact that they could not go to the university, they could not hold jobs, they could not, do, there were many things that women were deprived of about the only thing they were really uh, allowed to do was to be the, uh, in charge of households. And, and, and we're talking about all classes. Um, and the result was that slowly as aristocratic women who had a lot of money, inherited money, who were, came from powerful families and so on, were extremely well educated, but they were also frustrated because they could not do, it, do much in the public. In other words, the public sphere was not the sphere in which they could really, uh, let us say, show 
their great talents. And so they began uh, developing uh, what a lot of salons in the, in the 17th century. And by the end of the century, a woman uh, by the name of uh, Madame Dolnois uh, was the first, uh, she wasn't the first to write tales because there were many other uh, writers who wrote and published fairy tales or tell wonder tales of different uh, or legends and so on and so forth. But she in about, I think it's around uh, 1696 or so, uh, published the two volumes, which he called Contes de Fées. And uh, that these, it was the first time that phrase or uh, was used uh, to uh, designate uh, tales in which fairies were in charge <laughs> and powerful. And uh, gradually a group uh, a, a, uh, during this period, a group of maybe seven, eight or nine tales, they, they, they didn't visit the same salons all the time, but M Madame Donois had her own salon. They began uh, to use fairies and so they, there was no reference to a Christian God. Uh, they were uh, the women who, who determined the uh, fates of the characters in the tales were these amazing fairies who could be wonderful or could be very, very nasty. And uh, from that point on, the term uh, then was translated into English in the, uh, in, in the 18th century and, uh, and it stuck even though, for instance, in most of the later on, in most of the Grimm's tales, there are no fairies. And in fact, the great, but we call the Grimm's fairy tales because uh, somehow these wonder tales, these tales that uh, are based on uh, sort of these miraculous transformations that witches and, and fairies perform, uh, became the standard way that, uh, at least in English uh, and made in other countries, it, it, it was sometimes they didn't refer, they, didn't, they just used the word tail, you know? And uh, so it's quite interesting to, un, to realize that uh, the women came into their own in France and actually led the way uh, to have many other in the, following centuries, I, I, I just received a book from Wayne State University Press in which I'm uh, supposed to review a book uh, of tales written by French, Italian and German women uh, that have never been published before in the, in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. So it was much more alive than we realize because uh, after uh, the, this period from the 1690s and Charles Perrault, there was one man, Charles Perrault, who played a role in it and he gets a lot of credit that he doesn't deserve. The women were much more creative than he was, but his tales are very short and easier to remember than the tales that, that women, these women wrote because they're much different in tone and style. Right. Um, I'll just add a comment, like uh, fairy, the fairies did not come to Bengal at all. I mean, it came only <laughs> with the Arabian Nights. It's very interesting. So the concept of the fairy came to Bengal only with the Arabian Nights, uh, pretty yeah. late. So I'll, I'll, it's over to Oshijit. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, so thank you for your responses, Professor Zaitz. So my question is, um, why do you think the Grimm Brothers chose the title uh, Children and Household Tales if the volume was not meant for children, which of course it was uh, not? Uh, what contributed to this international myth about their work being for children? Uh, was it the result of a pre-existing romantic association with simple narratives and uh, children, or were the Grimm's instrumental in creating such an association? Secondly, uh, Tolkien calls, calls this association between fairy tales and children purely accidental. Do you agree, or, or can we trace it to specific points in history and thereby social conditions? Yes. Um, so you're, you're perfectly correct in saying that uh, the, the Grimm's... Uh, did not in any way uh, uh, create 
the, their volume of, of, of children's and household tales for children. Um, first of all, uh, the literacy, the, the, the first two editions uh, were, were not sold out, ever sold out, and they did barely, uh, poorly because they, the editions had footnotes and they were very scholarly. And it, uh, so what they were trying to do was to understand uh, the uh, commonality of uh, the German people at that time. And they wanted to uh, show that in, in uh, uh, they wanted to show how children were treated in the culture. Um, and uh, what, what was, or uh, what were the rituals? What were the uh, manners? What was the uh, sort of socializing or civilizing process? Uh, it, and how did people uh, uh, think about them? And so the, their task, and they sent a letter to many other people to help them uh, when they began collecting and publishing uh, the tales. Uh, and uh, it wasn't really, uh, they, they did not think about a great, great public. They were, weren't particularly uh, desirous to become stars or, uh, or, or let us say the leaders of discovering tales. What they wanted to do was to unite, to, to understand, to grasp uh, what was going on in people's lives. So, but what shifted uh, 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 and made these tales a little more acceptable uh, in the 19th century, uh, after the uh, second edition, was the fact that Edgar Taylor in, in London uh, decided to translate the tales and also illustrate them. They were not illustrated either up, up until that point. And uh, he sent a copy of his first edition to it, actually Wilhelm Grimm, the younger brother. And, he, and the, Wilhelm said to his brother, we are doing something wrong. We really have to appeal uh, to our people. Uh, you know, even though literacy was very low, but it was rising, the middle classes were rising. And as we know, in the 19th century was the great industrial revolution and more and more people were learning how to read and so on. And so for the first time, uh, so they decided in about 1824, 25, uh, to do a two sort of editions. One was going to be very scholarly, and, and there were seven editions that lasted till about, I think it was 1857. And um, at the same time, they were going to do a small edition uh, for uh, the a more popular edition of only 50 tales, because uh, at the end, in uh, the, the final ed edition, uh, in the scholarly edition, was, there were uh, 210 tales but they kept receiving tales from different people and so on. And so they had a, a, a nine, a nine editions of the smaller uh, series and that was for the general public and children began to read. There were more schools and more translations. It, it, once Edgar Pe Taylor actually was a pioneer in the fact that he translated the Grimm's and many other British uh, uh, writers began reading and uh, and enthusing. Uh, they were enthusiastic about these tales, and it led to uh, the Victorian period, in which there was a great deal of copying of the Grimm's, and tales were uh, were being sanitized. A lot of the tales were taken out or changed or uh, developed in different ways by different authors. But there was a great influence on. Uh, very creative writers at the end of the 19th century in England. And that's basically how fairy tales somehow became associated in the bourgeois sense with these are good tales for children. We read to them at night and so on and so forth. And it actually, I think, helped develop, uh, you know, uh, it really, there was no such thing as children's literature until the 19th century. I mean, children were always around and if they could read or hear 
they would imbibe the tales and uh, they would be influenced by the tales, but it really was this uh, very ironic change that happened due to uh, a, a tailor <laughs> in the uh, about 1823. Right. Um, so, so can the difference in nomenclature used to refer to fairy tales uh, in different points of time and space be read as a reference to the difference in the conceptions of the stories? So if yes, uh, then how does the idea of the French uh, court Dauphi uh, differ from the German Marchen, uh, the Russian oral wonder tale as Prop uses it, and the English fairy tale? Yes. Yeah, I don't think, you, you know, the, the, there are great differences in style, in, uh, in the aesthetics uh, of these tales that are either printed or told or ga gathered as literary or oral tales. Each country, and it's still going on today, each country is, and, and we're talking about regions. Uh, uh, I'm living in, as I've said before, in, in Siberia, in Minnesota, and... Uh, uh, I, this is a strange culture to me, and I've read, you know, there are many writers here who are writing fairy tales or publishing tales and so on, and uh, it's only after I've been here for a while, I've now been here a good 30 years or so, uh, that I'm slowly learning this culture uh, through the tales, and uh, so... It's always important, I think, when we write about these tales to take into consideration the social historical uh, background uh, to the tales as when they are published or made available. And uh, we also are, I think, uh, if we're going to be responsible scholars, we have to do research uh, into the background and history of these tales because they are similar uh, similar throughout. I mean, I published, uh, you mentioned uh, the golden age of folk and fairy tales. Uh, and uh, that book includes about uh, 20 different uh, uh, types. Uh, and these types, uh, and, and I gather tales mainly from the West, Western and Eastern Europe and show uh, in each chapter that there were different versions of, let us say, uh, a donkey skin uh, uh, or, uh, or Sleeping Beauty and so on. And they were given uh, different titles and different plots and so on. And it's it was really a fantastic because you learn so much about differences, di differences and commonalities at the same time. As I mentioned before, you know, with Little Red Riding Hood, but we could take a tale of Hansel and Gretel. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands of versions. And, and why, why is that so? It's because uh, the abuse of children uh, and the abandonment of children still goes on in all societies in the world. And, uh, you know, we can point, you know, to many different incidents which uh, immediately reflects in our minds, if we if we're familiar with fairy tales, Hansel and Gretel. I mean, uh, when um, you get an incident in, in America when the stupid uh, president uh, 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 that we had before uh, said separated children from their families, they were being abandoned. And it's only through a miracle that many of these children are still, you know, coming back. Well, it's all to Hansel and Gretel. That's what that tale is all about. And it's throughout the world that this tale is a, uh, enables us to grasp uh, what brings about or what causes, in, in the case of Hansel and Gretel, it was uh, poverty. Uh, uh, what brings about uh, a, a, a situation in which children are being abandoned. So I think that uh, I hope that answers your question to a certain extent. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so both, um, my next question is both psychoanalytic and the romantic view of uh, fairy tales or folk tales treats uh, them in an ahistorical manner. So, but they, but they have their own essentialist view as to the relevance and function of these stories. So when we 
do read stories as emanating from a particular time and space, what can explain the relevance of the genre to date? Uh, same story still being told and retold uh, across various media. To use, to use your own words, why do fairy tales stick? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, well, I, I recently, or let, let me say not recently, in the last 10 years or so, I've been very interested in mimetics, in memes. And uh, I, I've, uh, in 1970, when was it? Yes, 1976, so it's quite some time ago, Richard Dawkins published a book uh, called The Selfish Gene. And, and the last chapter, in the last chapter, he says, not only are we influenced by genes, but we are influenced by what he called memes. Now, today, the word meme uh, is used in a very popular way uh, uh, to uh, <clears throat> describe an incident or event or something that's flashy and, 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 and is distributed and disseminated throughout the world. Now that's false, that's horrible, uh, but that's the way the world is. You, you, you create a scientific term that means something else. Now what Dawkins was getting at uh, was that uh, our the, the great research in the brain about the brain is such that there may be part of our brain in which uh, information, relevant essential information to the welfare of the human species is sort of a, a, a apart apartmentalized. In other words, there's a section in our brain that retains uh, a color, bits of in, what he called bits of information. And, these, and, and the reason why, uh, and they have to last. In, in other words, a meme today can go, <laughs> according to the popular uh, sort of definition, the meme can just disappear and never re repeat. But that's not what, uh, what uh, Dawkins was trying to say that, that there are certain colors or information or uh, th uh, things that constitute a uh, important information that stick in our brains uh, because if we don't, uh, if, the, if it doesn't, uh, we will not be able to maneuver uh, and establish ourselves, gain autonomy over the environment or over other things that are hostile to us. And so uh, a, we can say, and I, I'll mention uh, again, well, we can switch to Cinderella, but I've already mentioned two tales, Little Red Riding Hood, and also, uh, what was the, uh, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, but you can go, the whole question of sibling rivalry is really important in Cinderella, because, and it's all about how families, what happens to families when someone dies and a new person comes in and so on, and who gets taken advantage of and why? And so this particular tale of Cinderella, which there, there are literally hundreds of thousands of versions in the world. Uh, even in the 19th century, a, a, a woman whose name I forget, in, in, in the 1890s, published 300 versions of Cinderella. Uh, already, you know, without the use of the computer or internet. And uh, so my theory is that uh, these, ter these tales that may have originated in Japan or, uh, are, uh, or, or we don't know where these tales necessarily uh, are originate. Uh, we try to find out where they originate and they stem from the interaction of people in given societies to explain uh, what uh, certain atrocious events or wonderful events and so on and so forth. But no matter what, they stick in the brain, they become memes because it's so essential to know uh, what our choices are in given situations, even though uh, the tale may not be all that happy. Uh, we have, uh, we, we have, there's a great misunderstanding about fairy tales. They're not all happy endings. And even if they're happy endings, you have to think after a marriage, what the hell is going to happen? 
<laughs> because marriages are, are really difficult to maintain. We're not monogamous. And so uh, all of these things that happen uh, symbolically, metaphorically in tales uh, are uh, somehow flash our, our brain and immediately we register, ah, yes, and so on. And we start to think about it in a certain way. Now, I may be wrong, okay, uh, to introduce memes. I've, I introduced it in, in a book called uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, about uh, uh, the apprentice, the sorcerer's apprentice. But I think that that is a way how we can explain uh, how these tales that, uh, that may originate in America and then go to India or from India goes to uh, Russia or things like that, that they're not, uh, uh, we really are universally similar as human beings. And the more we realize that, the better. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Zipes. Over to you, Amrita. I don't hear, I'm not. Uh, yeah. Yes, talking about the universal presence of tales, um, are you happy with the turn of Disney films in the 21st century? I'm referring particularly to the attempt to be racially and culturally more inclusive and present more empowering models for girls. Uh, you, you, the Disney Corporation is huge. It's a billion dollar corporation. Uh, and it just wants make, to make more and more money. It doesn't care about uh, human beings. It's a corporation. It wants to commodify everything. And uh, if we take uh, a, this film Frozen, which everybody rejoices about and says, oh, it's so wonderful, it's feminist, and this, two sisters, and uh, isn't this just a joyful, uh, is it? Is he really becoming uh, modern or up to date and, and, and so on? And it's a, that's a joke. It's ridiculous because why should we, uh, Frozen is, uh, first of all, uh, stereotypes, uh, Norwegians, the uh, people from uh, the Scandinavian countries, because most of the characters who are sort of typically uh, Norwegian or, or Swedish, and so on, are portrayed in a rather negative manner. But worse is the fact that the ideology is of, of this particular film is that we should be sorry for the most rich, the richest people in the world. Uh, and we should all try to do something to help these very rich ex living in a castle and we should be sympathetic, say, you know, like, like what, why? I always ask, why are the British so enamored of this stupid queen and her family? And there are many more important things in the world than these figures who are elites. And if you take uh, like the Lion King, almost all of the Disney fairy tale films are about the elites. They're elitists and, uh, and nothing, and there's nothing that really uh, dis, uh, shows what is happening to the poorer people. Why should the poor people work to help people who are just going to use power to uh, rule, the, rule the country the way they want to rule the country. So it's a myth. If you look at, at Frozen with its, its lovely uh, uh, sort of songs, it sort of disguises what is really going on in the world. And so uh, Disney has done that all the time. You go, uh, they've ruined Bambi. Bambi was a, was a film, was a story written in 1923 by Felix Sultan, an Austrian Jew, who wrote this, uh, this story about uh, deers being killed, Jews being killed, or Blacks being killed, and so on. In other words, the ideology of the book, of the novel, was totally different from the Disney film, which is a putrid film, because it basically uh, wants to uh, uh, convince us 
that living the, uh, uh, the way all bourgeois live, all middle class people live, is just delightful. And, uh, we, and, and Bambi marries and has all of these uh, uh, children. But of course, in the novel, in the novel, Bambi is desolate at the end. He's all by himself. And it's a totally different story. And the Disney film sort of covers up what is actually happening in the world. So uh, do I care for the Disney films? No. And there are hundreds of better films uh, that, uh, in the world than I can even recount right now. So as far as Disney is concerned and the corporation, the sooner it declares bankrupt and, uh, and doesn't show any more films, the better I'll feel. Um, let's hope, I don't think that will happen, but um, a methodological, <laughs> uh, coming to methodology, when we are studying uh, fairy tale and folk tale publications uh, of erstwhile colonies uh, and attempting to historicize them, a major problem is the absence of any sort of working notes, pre-publication texts, or any transcriptions. Um, like yes. I, we've read your reading of Grimm Brothers, and uh, it it was greatly helped by the discovery of the Olenberg manuscripts. So when yes. we are reading these other traditions, uh, can this problem be worked around? If yes, then how? Yes, uh, the, you, you know the. the... Uh, even today, uh, there are wonderful anthropologists who are interested in uh, all small communities, tribes, uh, 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 areas uh, that are isolated and so on, who do uh, amazing research uh, that enable us to understand uh, that they may not find uh, the, you know, because people didn't write that much uh, until the 20th century, really. So it's fa fairly recent that, that people could record and, and uh, uh, discover uh, the text that may have been written down. So there, there are major problems with regard to, uh, you know, uh, gathering the research that we need to understand what types of stories or how stories emanated and how they were distributed. But uh, good anthropologists who, who do their homework, who, who go and live in, in those regions and try to understand. And this happened, this began to happen thanks to the Grimm's at the end of the 19th century. The Grimm's themselves were not, you know, they, they were receptors of a lot of the tales were sent to them or uh, told to them and so on. But the real work began in the toward the end of the 19th century or the middle of the 19th century when uh, uh, people began uh, doing that research. Now in the case of perhaps India, there was a problem of colonization. And so one has to be, uh, I think, honest and responsible and uh, do further research uh, based on colony or colonist books that were published because we shouldn't destroy them. We shouldn't throw them out. They indicate something uh, about power, you know, in those times, and they may lead to way, you know, to societies that have tried to maintain, still maintain, even today in the 21st century, are still trying to maintain the same tales and rituals. Uh, we in America have, you know, wiped out the uh, Native Americans. Uh, and, uh, but nevertheless, very good anthropologists have uh, uh, finally, you know, well, it began in the 20th century, but uh, went to live with these people and tried to help them overcome the difficulties uh, uh, that they have suffered. And, and that, that also includes African Americans uh, who came, who were, you know, taken from Africa and brought here. So being a folklorist, uh, which I am not, I'm, I don't know what I am, uh, but I admire folklore and I, I try to work as a folklorist. Uh, but the, the role of folklorists is extremely significant. And the societies like the American Folklore Society, the British folklore, I'm members of both, both those societies are the people in, are 
uh, unfortunately having a difficult time in America. I don't know what it is like in India, but the humanities, what we call the humanities, uh, are being attacked and, and uh, positions in, at the universities are being cut. And uh, there are there used to be something like 20 or 30 folklore programs in America, and now there are only maybe two or three. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That's really a crime. And unfortunately, that's what's happening right now. It's the same. Um, so over to Shijit for final questions, and then we can take audience questions. Right. So, Professor Zipes, uh, what I wanted to ask is, what, according to you, is the reason for the massive amount of violence in Baydales, right, from, you know, the, the beheading of the child and cannibalism in Juniper Tree, let's say, uh, to the rape in the Italian version of Sleeping Beauty by Giam Battista Bastille? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a brief response. Uh, just look at the violence in our society. And... Uh, you know, the, the recent incident in the state of Colorado in Boulder, the shooting of uh, innocent people in a, in a uh, supermarket. Uh, capitalism is a, is, is a violent system. It's, uh, it, it's not a system in which encourages cooperation uh, and compassion. It's a system which means uh, you all, you, you try to compete and outdo the next person. You don't help them necessarily. Uh, you might want to uh, and, hit, um, and, and then exploit them. But basically uh, it's a meritocracy uh, in, in America that uh, covers up uh, the type of, I would say brutal competition in all aspects, sports, you name it, uh, business corporations, and so on. So uh, when you have a, uh, an ideology from that socialized and, and socializes children in such a way that they must be the best above everybody else, you're going to get uh, a type of violence that uh, it really will never abate until we transform uh, capitalism into some other socioeconomic system. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I've, I and many, many thousands or hundreds of thousands of people have, are trying, are still trying, but it's very difficult. And uh, it, uh, uh, right now, after four years of having the worst president in the world, uh, we're trying to just, uh, remake our society and it's going to take years and years to overcome what has occurred and i'm sure that in your society i i, I don't know india i've never been there i have wonderful scholars and colleagues and so on but uh i'm sure that it's happening also in your society as well yeah it's the same if not worse <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, do fairy tales? You, do you think that fairy tales operate at the margins of the symbolic order, or, or let's say, how can they be employed to subvert the oppressive forces of the apparatus surrounded by which uh, a child grows up? Yes. Yeah. I, I think you know. Uh, I think you mentioned that I've been a storyteller in public schools, public schools, not private schools, and in uh, in in the um, districts. Uh, where there's a lot of poverty. I've tried to, to focus my uh, efforts to help uh, deprived children. And, uh, and it, I've developed a method that I think uh, is, uh, uh, enables children to become storytellers of their own lives, to become storytellers. And you can do that uh, in, in, in the type of method that I've developed uh, based a lot on Johnny Rodari, an Italian uh, writer who wrote a great book. I, I mean, wrote many books, but one of his books was a theoretical book called The Grammar of Fantasy. And a lot of his ideas and other people's ideas I've taken in, in, uh, to use in uh, a classroom once a week for the entire school year. My, the people I've trained 
go into schools and spend each teaching artist goes into the same class every day for two hours to really enable uh, children to become much more literate and uh, also uh, learn what types of um, devices or I would maybe, I'm sorry, I think how their talents, uh, in, in other words, we try to develop their talents so that they can express themselves about the lives they lead. So the more we have, edu we have to reform totally the way schooling is done in America and other countries, because I've traveled and, and worked in other countries, you showing, trying to show what we do here. But if you if we can refocus and reform, radically reform education, which is now becoming privatized in America, it's, it's a terrible system now in America because uh, there's uh, uh, racism in the way everything is divided and certain schools get more money than other schools and things like that. It's just horrific. So unless we, we to begin at the beginning to reform America and its ideology, we really have to go into the schools and we really have to change the whole schooling system and also the way we plan cities and uh, to benefit everyone and not just a particular a group of people who have a lot of money. Right, and, and so my last question is, um, uh, can you talk about the presence and absence? You know, it's like a presence, oblique absence of sexuality in fairy tales. So some are tremendously sexual and yet they camouflage it and uh, with the use of symbols and forced morality. For, so what, what I'm trying to say is, if they were not meant for children, why shy away from sexuality? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't think that, uh, sexuality is significant. Uh, I think I uh, said, uh, oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, my answer to this, uh, in, in looking at your question, is that sexuality has become a commodity. Uh, and, and so why focus on sexuality? Uh, uh, in tales, uh, and they, they never were significant because that is not really what counts, I think, in terms of the way people live. I mean, obviously sex is great or sexuality is significant in all sorts of ways, but uh, I think there are, you know, the, there are tales about incest uh, in, uh, in, in the Grimm's collection and in, in other collections. Uh, there are many, uh, I would say symbolically uh, uh, incidents in the tales that refer to sexuality. Uh, but the tales don't make that uh, the sort of substance uh, and importance with regard to how we live. And it's, I think, uh, the rise of sexuality, which has been horrendous. I mean, uh, you can get pornography now anywhere, anytime, any second, in any type of uh, a book or, or film, uh, internet, and so on and so forth. So it's just to earn money. You know, it, it, it just uh, spices the, the film, the tale, and so on. And so uh, it's not that the people have avoided sexuality. It's in, you, you, if you read symbolically, what is going on, you understand uh, they, they're not going into detail about this because that is not the essential question. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Zayib. So let's uh, take a few of the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so Aubin asks, uh, how do fairy tales or their adaptations uphold, if at all, anticipatory illumination? If yes, how necessary are they in these extraordinarily challenging times? Uh, could you repeat that, that question? Yeah, it, it asks, how do fairy tales or their adaptations uphold, if at all, anticipatory illumination? If yes, how necessary are they in these extraordinary challenging times? Uh, again, one more time. The, uh, I'm, I'm having trouble with my, my hearing. 
Yeah, I, I think what, he's, what, he, what he wants to ask is how, how fairy tales can contribute uh, to, to, you know, to these extraordinary challenging times. Uh, how phases do? No, how, how, how the fairy tales can contribute to our generation, to these challenging times. Let's say the pandemic. Huh. Uh, oh, I, I see. Uh, okay, I got it. Um, well, you know, I think, and I don't know whether this is happening in India, but in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, fairy tales are all over the place. And uh, they're in films. Uh, it's amazing how many fairy tale films there are, not just the Disney films. And uh, they are uh, theater, operas, you, you name it. And I think that, again, uh, it's because uh, of the fact that uh, realism doesn't do it. Realism uh, is uh, not as effective as these tales, which make us think, and largely because they are so symbolical and metaphorical, that we have to really use our brains or imagination uh, in order to really grasp the essence of these tales. And of course, a lot of these tales are junk. I would say 90% of what we call children's literature is junk and uh, not worth reading or seeing or visualizing. I think what has to happen uh, in, in, my regard, in my regard, again, is it goes hand in hand with the reform of education at, at, in, in schools. Uh, we should be able to talk about violence, uh, about violence at home, and many other incidents that are uh, through through using tales, fairy tale, not not only fairy tales, but all types of tales, and that's what what I've tried to do in the program that I founded in, in 1995. Right. Uh, so Aratrika asks, uh, why have we always related fairies in Moors in the European context? Is the concept of understanding the barren, untamable land make us uh, create a mythical creature? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that once more again. I, I, th I think I think she wants to ask about the connection between fairies and moors, you know, in the European context. And and um, and uh, moors, uh, M U S E S E M W O R S. I think M W O R S. Moors. M W O R S. Um, I, don't I, think, I, I, think, I think I think I think what she I think what she wants to ask is you know do we look at the barren untamable land and create this mythical creature which we call fairy? Yes, yeah, you, you know every I think uh, this really depends on the tradition of a particular country as to what extent uh, you know there'll be fairies, dwarfs, witches, sorcerers, uh, apprentices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have to. Uh, really have a, a, a real understanding of the history of, uh, I would say, um, fantastic romantic works of art that emanated even in the Greco-Roman period before the Christian era in, uh, in, in uh, at least in the, in, in the European, Western European world. And so uh, it is uh, having an understanding of what, uh, uh, what these, animals, characters, and uh, personages are in, in their particular uh, tradition is important. Right. Uh, so uh, Keshav is asking, uh, what are your views on the uncanny nature of fairy tales? Of the what? Of the uncanny nature, the uncanny. Uncanny, OK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I've written about that, uh, about uh, Freud's notion of the uncanny. Uh, and, and, and I think, of course, uh, the uncanny is extremely impo important because of the fact that it distances us from the incidents. In other words, uh, when something happens that is uh, uh, really uh, not in the reality of our everyday, uh, we're shocked. We're, it, it's, it estranges us from that uh, particular incident. And that, I think, 
causes us to start thinking in a different way out of the box. And I think today uh, we, we, are, we tend to be in the civilizing process homogenized. And the, the civilizing process homogenizes us to accept conditions which are really unfair, unjust, and criminal. Uh, and the fact that uh, literature or teaching can do that, it, uh, the literature and teaching, uh, all of that becomes dangerous because we automatically do what is expected of us. So we need the uncanny. We need uh, what we call fantasy literature because, and, and of course not every writer or artist or painting or something will shock us in the same way or shock us. But for the most part, I think that the uncanny is extremely significant because we must pause, we must be shocked and ask ourselves, why, do we, why are we do, living the lives we are le uh, living without thinking carefully about what it might do to other people and uh, just do to the world, in fact? Uh, thank you so much, Professor Zayed. So we had many more questions, but we are really short of time, really short of time. So I would, uh, you know, pass the mic to Amrita for the vote of thanks. And I, I also request uh, uh, the, the audience uh, to mail me the questions. I'll surely forward them to Professor Zayed, and I'm sure she, he'll answer them back. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I couldn't ask all the questions. Yes, Amrita. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we were short on time, so um, thank you, Professor Zaid, for taking out the time to discuss politics, sexuality, and cognition in fairy tales with us. It is fascinating to read fairy tales as signifying systems that emerge out of material contexts that are rooted in specificities of time and space, but at the same time have the potential to transcend those very boundaries. So a big thank you to all the participants who have joined this discussion with us today. I hope it has been as enriching for you as it has been for me. So thank you. Good day. Uh, good night. Uh, all of it. Thank you. Great. Thank you for inviting me and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.